From Here to the Stars. I am your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. Our guest today is Erica Nesvold. She has a PhD in physics and a background in computational astrophysics. Our guest today is Dr. Erica Nesvold. She has a PhD in physics and a background in computational astrophysics. She has written two books on space, ethics, and social justice, and co-founded a nonprofit organization, the Just Space Alliance, with the mission to advocate for a more inclusive and ethical future in space, and to harness visions of tomorrow for a more just and equitable, wor equitable world today. But before I get into those topics, I want to ask about your work as an astrophysicist and developer for the simulation software Universe Sandbox. I've never used it myself, but I have watched videos on YouTube that were created with it. If you would describe what the software allows the user to do, what has been your contribution, and how did you get involved with the project? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Universe Sandbox is, I, I like to call it an astrophysics and gravity simulator disguised as a video game. I, it's a, it was a dream job for me. When I was working as a research scientist, research astrophysicist, I wrote a lot of models of, of gravity, the way that objects uh, move around each other in space. I was using that to write papers about how to find exoplanets, planets around other stars, by looking at asteroid belts and the way that the gravity from the planets can shape those belts. Um, and then I found this job with Universe Sandbox, which has the same really, really realistic underlying physics and gravity simulation, but someone else on the team has made really beautiful graphics and there's a great user interface where, unlike my code when I was a, a scientist that I would just send off to the supercomputer and it would run and come back and spit out a bunch of numbers, Universe Sandbox, you can you can interact with it as it runs. You can watch the solar system and then say, well, what happens if I launch um, a black hole through the middle of the solar system and you what happens is very entertaining but it's also realistic and so um and and gorgeous just absolutely beautiful graphics so you can use it to do little fun what if experiments you can use it to get a better intuition about the size of space and the way things move in space um you can learn we have a uh, several guides that will teach you specific things about uh, space physics and uh, and you can just use it to make beautiful art. So it's been a great project that I've been working on it for about five years now. And uh, just this week, I'm really focused on uh, climate simulations. So I'm learning a bunch about atmospheric heating and things like that. So it's been fun for me because I'm always learning. Mm -hmm. And I suppose you find it by going to Universe, uh, Universe Sandbox, uh, doing a search for that. That's right. It's universesandbox.com. It's it's for sale on Steam, which is where a lot of video games for PC are sold. Um, but there's a lot of other places. I think it's uh it's in the Mac, the the Windows Store, um, and, and places like that. It doesn't yet exist outside of of PCs, uh, and and you can run it on Macs too. We're developing a mobile version that will, will run on phones too. But you can imagine there's some challenges there. So that's still in process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think. Uh, you have uh, two books on space, ethics, and social justice. One is an anthology, which you co-edited with James Schwartz and Linda Billings, Reclaiming Space, Progressive and Multicultural Visions of Space Exploration. It's from uh, Ox Oxford University Press. The other is a solo effort, which you adapted and updated from your podcast, which is called Making New Worlds. The title is Off Earth, Ethical Questions and Quandaries for Living in Outer Space, published by MIT Press. Uh, by the way, when I looked at it on March 24, Amazon has it listed as the number two best-selling book in ebook format in the category Science and Math Ethics. Um, in that book, the very first chapter has the title, How Do We Begin? And three subheadings in that chapter are, Should We Settle Space? Why Are We Going? And Who Gets to Go? So let's talk about the very first one, Should We Settle Space? It would be a very short book, of course, if the answer was definitely no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what are your thoughts in this area, and what thoughts, perhaps, of others did you uh, have you presented in the book? Yeah. So, as you mentioned, this book was a, an adaptation and an expansion on a podcast, a, a limited run podcast I made back in 2017, 2018. And in that podcast, I made this one of the last episodes. Should we settle space? Because throughout all the conversations I'd had about the challenges, I kept coming back to, okay, well, why are we doing this? And should we be doing it at all? And then when I decided to rework it for book form, I realized I needed to move that question right up front. And as it turns out, it's the first question I'm usually asked in interviews. So, uh, so it made a lot of sense to put it up front. I think it's a question we have to ask 
at the beginning of any efforts to settle space and also all along the way and at the end of the process. Because I certainly talk to a lot of people and I quote some of them in the book who don't believe that we should either ever settle space or don't believe perhaps that we're ready as a species and that we should mature more or learn more about how to do space ethically before we should go into space. I don't completely agree with those people. I think it's worth having those conversations. Always it's good to have conversations with people who don't agree with you but they make some good points about the potential damage we could do to ourselves and to space. So, so it's worth having conversations. But personally, I think that for one thing, we the, I don't agree that we should wait until we're ready to go to space because I don't think humans will ever all agree as a group on, on what ready means. Uh, so, I mean, there's people right now who think that we're ready and there's people who don't, and I'm not sure that's ever going to change. I also believe very strongly that the effort of going to space and to try to figure out the answers to all the really challenging questions I ask in the book, that process itself can help humans back on Earth, can help us mature as a species, which which is the goal for all of us, I think. Um, and so I think as long as we do it deliberately and carefully, uh, it's a process that can help people who will never leave Earth um, just as much as it will help people who live in space. Yeah, I'm I'm afraid of heights. I'll never go off the earth. It's not going to happen. Just well, getting on top of a rocket would be scary for me. That's an important thing to remember is when you're thinking, you know, I spend the whole book thinking about our descendants in space, but it's important to remember we're not evacuating the planet. There's there's mm -hmm. very few scenarios where nobody would be left on the earth. So we have to make sure that we're, you know, leaving something behind and, and producing something of value for the people who are afraid of heights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. The second subheading is... Um, uh, why are we going? And then who gets to go? Who gets to go sounds like a kind of a loaded question. Uh, if you would just address that one. So so who gets to go is is one of the first big questions when you think about how should we settle space? Because the first thing you have to decide is, all right, well, who gets to actually board the rockets and, and go to space? It's not going to be all of us. Um, and it turns out that's a question we're already dealing with today and have been since we started humans sending humans into space is we had to, NASA and and, and uh, the Russian space agencies had to decide who are we putting on the rockets. And that decision process has evolved with time. It's no longer just um, white male test pilots, right? We Or military people, That's it's expanded uh, significantly who, who NASA will pick. But even NASA still has pretty strict constraints on who they send into space. Now that we have this private space industry, that uh, that narrow window is opening up a little bit, uh, but that really just adds an extra path to space if you're rich enough to buy a ticket. But if we're thinking longer in the future and we're trying to put uh, thousands of people on a big spaceship to go off to Mars and, and start a settlement, you have to ask, well, which, which thousand people are you going to pick? And how will the decisions we make in that step affect the settlement long into the future? Um, because not only do you have to make sure you're picking all of the right skill sets you need. So you need the engineers, you need the pilots, uh, you need leaders, you need dentists and plumbers, and you don't want to forget any of these things. Mm -hmm. But um, presumably you're trying to represent humanity. So you want to make sure you're re representing all of humanity, as many cultures and, and languages and backgrounds and experiences as you can. Um, and also you want to make sure that if we're going to reproduce in space and have a, an independent space settlement that can just keep uh, growing throughout time, then the decisions you make about the, the, the health and the background and the genetic diversity of your initial population is also going to perpetuate throughout time. So it's just a lot of big decisions wrapped up in that one question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, have we covered why are we going? I mean, I know why no, we're so going. <laughs> we skipped that one. Well, it's a, it's, it's an interesting question because for an individual, maybe mm -hmm. the answer is really easy. But uh, as a whole, it turns out all these individuals have very different ideas about why we're going to space. And the answer to that question will affect every decision we make, including who are we putting on the rockets. So I look in that chapter, I looked into some of the big, really uh, common narratives that are that are happening right now about why we should go into space. There's the idea that um, we need to not keep all of our eggs in one basket. If something does happen to Earth, we want a, a backup Um planet, a back of population. Uh, there's an argument that uh, it's hum humanity's destiny to to go to the stars, which is honestly a little more uh, hand wavy. Uh, people get very emotional about these these topics. But uh, the, there's also a similar argument that um, 
it people like to draw parallels to the colonization of North America. That's uh, you know, it's a great frontier. It's our nature. It's how we Im improve the universe is by going out and colonizing it. But um, a lot of those historical parallels have uh, problematic parts to them, and we need to pay attention to that as well, and really ask ourselves. What fundamentally do we want uh, in space and, and how is that going to affect what we do there? Some people just want to make money, which uh, is a motivation for a lot of people on Earth. But that will mean that you perhaps make different choices with your space settlement than if you're trying to uh, conduct science or um, or preserve the human species, for example. So so what's your reason to go to space? You said you had one. I have two. One is uh, don't keep all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. If the human beings, if human civilization is going to survive, it needs to be on more than one planet. I mean, long term for, yep. they, you know, for thousands of years, that kind of sub survival. I'm a member of the the Lifeboat Foundation. Mm -hmm. I'm on a couple of their board, uh, board of directors. Um, but also um, growth, uh, prosperity. There are more resources in space than there are on the Earth. Um, the, we tend to think of the Earth as a large, you know, sphere, but we can't really mine very much of it. Just the, the outer, maybe maybe one or two miles deep. But asteroids, because of the zero g, they're you know all of it is available. You can mine the entire thing all the way to the center of Ceres, um, which is five hundred miles in diameter. It's uh, and so there is a lot of opportunity for prosperity and growth. And, yeah, the the idea that we need uh, we need progress and that that growth beyond our our limitations on our planet that's a very a very common one. And uh, I think one of the things I pointed out in my book is we can't we can't just have an an either or. Uh, if we're going to have progress and expansion, if that's what you're committed to, that doesn't mean we don't need to figure out how to live sustainably in an environment, right? And that's what a lot of people criticize about the idea of space colonization is oh you're just going to um, trash one planet and move on to the next one. There was an environmental ethicist who called that the uh, disposable planet mentality, which I think is a great phrase. Um, and so that's the kind of thing I point out. Doesn't mean that that we can't have progress or that you can't go to space, but maybe we should keep both in mind at the same time, is how do we uh, conserve and recycle resources that we have while also figuring out how to get more resources. Mm -hmm. Also, I think space has been a big uh, learning curve for human beings in that we have... Uh... By going to places that are not sustainable for you, for, you know, you can't breathe any air and there's no gravity for you to, you know, sift flour. Um, it makes, it, it, it drives home how perfect he, uh, earth is for human mm -hmm. beings. You can walk around without a breathing apparatus outside in yep. the sun. You, and we take it for granted. Yes. It is so wonderful on earth. <laughs> And every time we go into space, whether we're going to Mars or wherever, you know, sending probes to the outer solar system, we it drives home just how good Earth is. Um, and, you know, it, it becomes kind of a, a bit of a wake up call for some people. That, you know, and I should say, in fact, the uh, the the ethicist who coined the phrase "disposable planet" mentality—I think it was William Hartman—he um, he said he doesn't actually think people will end up with that mentality because as soon as we get out there, we'll figure out that there's no better place in the solar system. I think this was his quote: "Where you can stand naked in the light of the sun," which is yes. uh, evocative <laughs> and but true. There's there's nowhere else in the solar system you can even take your helmet off. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think we'll be we'll be fond of Earth for a long time. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, chapter two is titled, How Will We Live in uh, Live With the Land? Its first section is, Who Owns Space? Um, and then, How Will We Share the Space Environment? And then, How Can We Protect the Space Environment? Uh, let's go with the first one, if you would. Who Owns Space? Yeah. So this is a, this question people love to start thinking about almost immediately when they start thinking about space mining or uh, uh, building settlements in space is we've had everyone who studied even a little bit of history on earth is aware of how many conflicts we've had over territory, over land and the, and the resources in the land and then just the space itself. Uh, people get, again, very a lot of emotions connected to the land where we come from and the land where we live. Uh, and so they immediately want to say, well, well, who does own space? How, how does that work if nobody owns it now? 
how is that going to change in the future? We have, uh, this is where a lot of the space law is in the book, because this is where a lot of space law has been focused until now. We have this big international treaty called the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, uh, which you can tell by the name was created in, during the Cold War. So it's got a lot of uh, really key things, like it says you can't uh, explode nuclear weapons in space, which I think is a great thing to include. And it says that nations can't appropriate territory in space. So that means that a country can't go to the moon, for example, and say, this belongs to my country now. But the Outer Space Treaty doesn't really talk about private individuals or companies, which are the people right now who are most interested in going and, and mining in space. Um, and so this is still a bit of an open question, mostly because a lot of different lawyers and regulators have opinions on what, what the law means, but it hasn't really been tested in court yet. So we'll find out really when the first conflict comes up. Because as much as we like to think of space as being infinite and having infinite resources, it turns out that the resources, the valuable resources that we can reach are not infinite, they're finite, and they tend to be clustered in the same locations. So there's the asteroids, like you mentioned. On the moon, a lot of people are interested in mining uh, water ice on the moon, and that's in very specific places or around the poles and in, in craters. Um, and so that kind of situation could easily lead to a lot of conflict. So there's rules uh, in the Outer Space Treaty, and the U.S. is trying to put together the Artemis Accords to say, okay, if you want to have an activity like you're mining a patch, a crater on the moon, we're going to draw a safe zone around it, and we're going to have consultation and deconfliction to make sure that nobody is causing interference to each other. But as the land starts to get gobbled up on, on the moon or, or someplace like that, we'll inevitably, I'm sure, we'll start to see conflicts. So it's going to be a test of our our international relationships and our idea of space as being a, a peaceful place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Years ago, I interviewed uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, a uh, science fiction writer. And my question was, will we ever reach a point where we use non-lethal weapons for warfare? And he said, we already do. We call it the courts, um, yeah. which I thought was a good point. Uh, and so space law sounds like a, a massively growing area for the near Absolutely. future. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, the way the question was formed, um, what is it? Uh, who owns space? It sounded at first like the vacuum. And then I thought, no, she means, you know, objects in space, you know, asteroids in the moon, but also locations in space, the actual vacuum, the like low yeah. Earth orbit, they're very valuable. Low, low Earth orbit is, is a key place. We'll talk about this in a minute because I'm going to talk about the environment, but Low Earth orbit is literally empty space, and yet it's a place where uh, people have conflicts over over territory, in particular uh, the best orbital slots, because the the band of empty space around the Earth isn't uh, isn't all equal, right? There's different places in orbit that are more advantageous for whatever you want your satellite to do. If you want your satellite to look at one spot or scan your enemy's territory or whatnot, and certain orbits are easier to get to in terms of energy and easier to maintain. And so um, there is a whole system for figuring out who gets what orbital slot. It's related to the way that we. Um, assign uh, uh, frequencies for telecommunications. It's kind of a first come first serve, but at least we have an organized system for that. And yet we still have a lot of problems with things like orbital debris um, just right in our backyard. So it wouldn't be a surprise if, if that ends up being a problem somewhere we can, we can actually touch instead of just empty space around our planet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, how can we protect the space environment? Uh, that's a, a, a sort of a strange sounding question to me. I tend right. to think of space as sterile and 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 doesn't really need that much protection. But uh, what are your thoughts on that area? Yeah, that's that's a great point. So um, when most people think of environmentalism or environmental protection, they're picturing rainforests, they're picturing coral reefs, and everything I'm listing here is is the life, not the the non living stuff underneath the life. Um, so it's kind of it was a shift for me to start to think about the space environment, if we assume it's lifeless, let's assume for now that, that we don't find any life there. Um, is it worthy of protection? Does it have some kind of intrinsic value? Does it have a right to exist as it is beyond whatever use it can serve for us? And this is a complicated question that people answer differently. Um, different philosophers argue about the the intrinsic value of, of abiotic material of, of rocks, basically. And also different cultures have very different ideas about this um, here on Earth. There's different places on Earth where particularly indigenous cultures 
give uh, uh, understand mountains and such as having personhood and even legally in um, New Zealand uh, was the first example of this. There's a river, the Wanganui River, which New Zealand law recognizes as having legal personhood. There's a human representative that speaks for the river uh, in, in court cases about whether some other group wants to do something environmentally damaging, for example. And there are people who have argued that we need something like that for the moon, some recognition of its legal personhood. And if that if anyone is watching or listening to this and just think that's that's a step too far, that probably means you weren't raised in a culture that that thinks of of personhood and and value for for non living stuff. But it turns out that not only do a lot of humans feel that way, so we need to recognize that. But when you start to have that mental model of environments, it tends to mean that you come up with better ways to live with that environment. So when I say, do we need to protect the the space environment? I mean, from ourselves as well, because we could easily go mine everything useful out of the moon or the asteroid belt, not in yours or mine lifetimes, but we could do it pretty fast. Humans are pretty good at exponential growth. And maybe we need to think about how to recognize its value as itself and recognize its value for future generations to make sure that we're just not gobbling up everything in the solar system, like some kind of Pac-Man. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> I thought you were going to go originally when I was anticipating <laughs> the interview that you were going to go for, uh, if someone were to go to the moon and gouge out uh, uh, something that would be visible from the earth and they d- drew the Pepsi logo on mm. the face of the entire moon. That would clearly be a def, uh, 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 defacing, damaged, so, right? Yeah, yeah, def- yeah, because but not because of its effect on the moon, but because right. everybody looks at the moon and admires the moon. We think of oh, John, you know, it's a beautiful big rock, it's romantic, and things like that, and it would that, alter that. That is a great point. When I've had those discussions before, most of the p- m- space mining people I talk to say, "Oh, nothing we would do would actually be visible." from earth which might be true for now but yeah i could certainly imagine if if we wanted to we could make something visible uh from from the earth on the moon and and i brought that up before because yeah you make a great point that the moon even more than the stars the moon is something that's so important to all of us as individuals and to cultures i mean not just some cultures just see it as romantic some cultures see it as part of their their religious um beliefs and it's just been there longer than any of us have. And so the idea of us uh, making this permanent change for, you can think of some reasons that are less impressive than others, like, like drawing, drawing your, your favorite logo or, um, or just, you know, scarring it from, from mining. Um, is that really what we want to do? Should we at least take a moment to think about it and talk amongst all the humans and see if this is what we want to do with our neighbor? I think, I think that's worth asking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Chapter three, how will we live with each other? Uh, which starts with, uh, where's my money? What if someone steals my stuff and who's in charge? Let's start with, uh, uh, what if someone steals my stuff? <laughs> yeah. So all these questions are about, uh, you know, what's that quote? Hell is other people. We can, we can mm-hmm. go into, we could talk about space itself and the physical environment of space, but at some point, if we want to have space settlements, we have to figure out how to live with each other in this really austere, dangerous environment. And uh, criminal justice is one of these questions that turns out to be really tricky. So uh, what if someone steals my stuff? What if there is some kind of interpersonal crime in a space settlement? Uh, This hasn't come up much because people have been pretty peaceful in space so far, but you can imagine it's probably going to happen eventually if we bring enough people into space. What do we do about it? So that leads to all sorts of questions like, well, what are the laws up there that has to do with who's in charge and what government system are we using? Then you have to ask, do we have some kind of investigators? Do we have some some people to um, respond to crime? Who's going to be the judge and, and jury? You know, who decides what someone's actual guilt? Is there going to be any consideration of the fact that maybe in a brand new space settlement, some people are more important to the settlement than others, just practically? Like if the person who's accused is the only one who knows how to work the life support system, does that mean they get a pass on certain things that other people would be, you know, there's questions like that. And then once you answer all those questions, you have to ask, okay, you found someone guilty of a crime. What do you do with that person? Because prisons don't exist in space. If, if we want to build them, that's going to be extremely impractical. You're going to need the resources, the physical space. It needs uh, to be pressurized and have air and heat and light. Um, you need labor to do all that building. Maybe you need labor to be the guards, depending on what kind of system you have. 
And then that person that you're imprisoning, you have to take out of the labor pool. They're not contributing anything back to the society. You still have to feed them uh, and, and, and give them resources without getting anything back. If you want to force them to work, that leads to all sort of other horrific uh, abuses that we've seen throughout history of forced, forced labor can, can end up really badly. And, uh, and what are the alternatives? You can't banish them from the settlement because if you kick them out an airlock that's essentially just a death sentence you okay. can't just use the death sentence on anything or, or you've created a really terrible dystopia um and so it's a it's a complicated problem and what i point out in the book is that that kind of thought lets you look at earth and say okay well prisons aren't exactly a fantastic system here on earth either our current prison systems no matter which angle you come at it i think everyone agrees there's problems with our prison system in the u.s in particular so what what are the solutions we could imagine for space? Other ways, perhaps, to address certain kinds of crimes that other cultures have used successfully. And if we can imagine them for space, maybe we can imagine them for improving our criminal justice system here on Earth, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, who's in charge? Sounds like governance. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So who who makes all the rules that that mm -hmm. uh, the laws that I was just talking about? Someone breaking this is even bigger than criminal justice, of course, because. Um, I, in this chapter, I get into the idea of war in space. And of course, Star Wars are things that all of us have spent a lot of time imagining, including Kim Stanley Robinson. He has some excellent examples in his Mars trilogy of um, ways that you could really hurt other people in a space settlement really easily mm -hmm. because um, it's unstable, it, inherently it's unstable. Says, <laughs> right. All you have to do in space is let the air out. And if you're in space and trying to, to attack Earth, you just have to drop rocks on them. It's just it gets mm -hmm. a lot easier to hurt each other when you're in that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to ask, um, how are we going to decide who makes decisions about resource use or interpersonal crime or whatnot in space? And how are the people living in space going to interact with the people back on Earth? Because as an American... Obviously, the first thing it makes me think of is when are they going to have a war of independence and declare themselves independent? But mm -hmm. I, I talked to a colonial historian for the podcast in the book, and she pointed out that uh, Americans do tend to think that way because of our history. But most colonies throughout um, throughout history on Earth haven't had violent revolutions. There's there's ways to have good relations with the the nation that sent you out there. Um, either independently or or keeping a good relationship without violence. And so we should look at those examples, not just trying to uh, to recreate 1776 in space. That was Erica Nesvold. This has been From Here to the Stars, a video series produced by the Interstellar Research Group. The IRG is a nonprofit organization dedicated to thoroughly exploring the science and engineering that can eventually open up the reality of interstellar travel. Find out more about our next symposium at irg.space. I have been your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, and you can subscribe to our channel for other such videos. On behalf of all of us here at the Interstellar Research Group, I thank you.